Thank you. Give you a 10 minutes warning. Okay. Before. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay, so first I wanted to thank the, our hosts and the organizers of this workshop for uh, asking me to come here. It's a very interesting experience and a very nice forum for, um, for this uh, topic, uh, I think. So um, Martin asked me to give a talk on um, our collaboration, which is a mouthful, Fermilab, Lattice, Milk, TUM, QCD. Um, three collaborations join forces to determine the quark masses. Well, it actually started out with a calculation of the um, B and D meson decay constants, and, and uh, then this was uh, some follow-up work on that. Um, so first, I just wanted to um, list the references upon which this talk is based and also point out to you that Actually, the person who should be giving this talk is Javad Komijani, who um, was the driving force behind the calculation that I will be presenting, uh, and also one of the main drivers of the calculation of the B and D meson decay constants that, uh, that preceded the quark mass work. Um, he's uh, somewhat of a victim of uh, global politics, uh, so he's Iranian and he is now back in Iran. I hope he comes back to physics, but uh, we don't know. That's a, <clears throat> uh, that's a pretty significant uh, departure for our, for our collaboration, as is hopefully emphasized by this already. So uh, just, just to give you a brief uh, discussion of what this all means is, as I said, we started out by doing a calculation of the B and D meson decay constants um, on the HISC ensembles that first milk and then Fermilab milk has been generating using the heavy HISC or all HISC approach. And out of this work then uh, grew the idea that as a byproduct of the decay constants, one also calculates the mass spectrum and uh, out of that then grew the idea that one could use the calculated mass spectrum also as a determination of the quark masses. And so Javad actually started thinking about this and started thinking about masses. And from that grew this work, which, which uh, created some new insights into the uh, renormalon, into the normalization, and uh, was then used these insights were then used in a paper that Javad wrote while he was a postdoc at, uh, at TUM in Munich um, with Nora and Andreas and Antonio uh, on this proposed new mass, which is the minimal renormalon subtracted mass. And uh, that was then used in the analysis of the quark masses. Okay. So here's an uh, outline of my talk, uh, just to orient yourselves. I, have an, I do have a little bit of an introduction in Lattice QCD, maybe not needed for this audience, but there's a few points I would like to make here. And then also a little bit on quark masses, again, probably not needed here, but to make the points. And then a longer discussion on how to, on the framework in which we're doing our calculation and the um, minimal renormalon subtracted mass, the, uh, the simulations and the fits, results and comparisons and outlook. Okay, so um, I like to show this to make the following point. Of course, when we do lattice QCD calculations, there are lots of approximations. We approximate derivatives, we are, we are in a finite spatial volume, a finite time extent. So these are all approximations to the real world. That's the bad news. The good news is that with these approximations come tunable parameters. And so by studying, uh, by studying the theory as a function of these parameters, we can actually gain some insights that are hard to gain from just living in the real world where the masses are what they are, et cetera. So, uh, the, using this disadvantage to our advantage, 
of course. And of course, as everybody knows, we need to calculate these integrals numerically. That's why they are sitting in a finite box, et cetera, using, using Monte Carlo methods, and I won't really be talking about that. Now, together with all of these tunable parameters, and that's the power of lattice QCD, come effective field theory uh, descriptions that we can use in order to turn lattice QCD into an ab initio description of QCD. So finite lattice spacing is guided by semantic effective field theory, uh, the light quark mass dependence, which nowadays is not really an extrapolation anymore, not in the work I'll be showing you, but is an interpolation, but is still guided by Carroll perturbation theory. In some cases one can just use Taylor expanding expansions if one is close enough, heavy quark uh, interpolation and extrapolations and understanding the pattern of discretization effects and et cetera is uh, very useful to use heavy quark effective field theory. And then there's also the uh, infrared behavior by described by finite volume effective field theory. I don't know if that's what it's called, but this is basically a nod to Martin Lucia who started uh, thinking about this. Needless to say, in order to have realistic calculations, we need to have large volumes, small lattice spacing, so that's a multi-scale problem, and we need to vary everything in order to use these EFTs to perform fits to extrapolate to the continuum. So this is not automatic to be up an issue. This is basically based on a careful and, and serious study, and we already heard several talks today that were describing that. This is, just a, uh, this is just a reminder of semantic EFT that in semantic EFT we can describe discretization effects in terms of continuum matrix elements which, which, uh, with, with coefficients that, um, that uh, then take us to, to the continuum. Um, okay, that's all really well known. Um, a little bit on heavy quarks, since that's um, what we will be, what I'll be discussing here um, quite a bit. So once you've done your semantic EFT, you know how, depending on what your quark action is, when, what your actions are, you can analyze discretization effects, and almost everybody's using actions nowadays where they start um, with quadratic errors. Um, and the scale here will be usually lambda QCD unless there are other scales in the problem that are larger than lambda QCD, then those will be dominating this, the discretization effects. For B quarks, this has been a problem with the, um, with the uh, available ensembles and lattice spacings that we have had. This is also something that is becoming increasingly a past thing, um, but uh, Still, in lattice units, the B quark mass on most ensembles for most collaborations is still large. So two ways to deal with that. In one way, one avoids large discretization effects uh, altogether by using effective field theory. This can be done in different ways, uh, starting with an EFT and discretizing, or using an EFT to do the matching. Um, in either, in either framework, one avoids these errors, but one, uh, one, accum one, one uh, receives um, significant complications because the matching and renormalization is now much more complicated. And um, these, these methods were very important to establish heavy quark physics and lattice QCD as a tool, but um, nowadays uh, we've gone back Simpler, if you want, we're going back to brute force methods where one uses the same lattice action for heavy quarks as for light quarks, which allows us to use uh, nifty things like word identities, etc. And it makes the pattern of renormalization usually much simpler, especially if you have a, an action with enough uh, chiral symmetry. And uh, but that limits that limits the simulation here. So then the name of the game here is first of all to have, uh, to use an action that's improved enough so that these don't grow too quickly and uh, to push this to rather small lattice spacings. And then one can still supplement this with heavy quark effective field theory inspired um, treatment of the heavy quark dependence. 
Okay, so that's the kind of the general setup. And uh, just as another comment, this is very standard now that um, one throws everything into a combined Carl continuum heavy quark um, fit, if you want. So Carl perturbation theory um, guides the light quark mass dependence. And uh, then one can include discretization effects, in particular for staggered fermions, which we're using in this talk, um, the including discretization effects in the Carroll logarithms has been very advantageous. And, um, but in any case, one can modify the, the Chi-PT to, to include discretization terms. One can also add heavy quark discretization terms in these fits. And, then for heavy light mesons, um, add heavy meson chi PT um, in, in this as well. And that's an outline of what we're doing as well. So um, I will be coming back to this plot. This is just to uh, show for the Carl continuum fits, then the two relevant parameters are often the pion, the, the pion mass of the C pions and the lattice spacing. And a serious stimulation would, would try to, to cover this. Here you see the ensembles we'll, we're using where we have ensembles with five lattice spacings at the physical point where the C pions, well, the Goldstone C pions have, have their proximate physical mass. Um, but I also wanted to point out that uh, Fermilab milk is by no means alone. There's, there's a growing a number of of collaborations who, who have ensembles with physical mass, so the need to extrapolate is very quickly going away. Okay, I'm going to skip this, and I uh, couldn't resist. Uh, Martin asked me to talk about the, um, the quark masses, but uh, I, I think the, the context in which um, talking about lattice QCD determinations of quark masses should be put into the context of where we are as a field. And here I just wanted to make the point that the state of the art is rather advanced. We now have quite a lot of quantitative lattice QCD calculations, many in the flavor sector for weak matrix elements, where we have achieved sub-percent precision, where the total errors are either commensurate or even smaller than the corresponding experimental uncertainties. And um, by the way, all of this uh, body of work, worldwide effort, um, is reviewed in the flag review, which I'll be showing results as well about. And then, there, and then we're reaching to, um, and a lot of effort is being put into extending the reach of lattice QCD calculations. So that's the background, if you want. And here's just one example of one, one quantity where the where their individual results with sub-percent precision and the averages also are less than 0.2%. And um, it's a particularly simple quantity, I grant you, but that's that's where we're um, that's where, where we're at with um, lattice QCD calculations. Okay, now let me uh, talk about quark masses. Uh, just stating things that are hopefully very obvious to everybody. These are, of course, the fundamental parameters. they are also fundamental parameters in lattice QCD. And in lattice QCD, um, we can determine the quark masses through the, their dependence, um, through the dependence of the hadron masses on them and calculating the hadron masses and then tuning the hadron masses uh, tuning the hadron masses to take on the physical value, tuning the quark masses so that the hadron masses take on their physical value is then how we can determine the quark masses in principle very, very accurately. Of course, this gives us the bare lattice mass, which depends on the details of the lattice action, which by itself is not very useful for phenomenology. So what we really want, of course, are the renormalized masses and what people need who, for example, um, want to test whether the uh, Higgs decay rates that are measured are the same as what is predicted by the standard model. People need MS bar masses here, which of course is defined in perturbation theory only. And we've already heard quite a few talks. So just converting directly from Bayer to MS bar using perturbation theory is um, 
you know, limits the accuracy because lattice perturbation theory is really hard. Um, but combining the lattice QCD calculation with continuum perturbation theory um, is, is then a much better way. And there are several approaches. We've heard about the alpha collaborations approach, for example, where you calculate an intermediate quantity based on the Schrodinger functional, and then you only have to convert to MS bar at a high scale. And there's uh, other similar schemes. Um, another, another separate approach is these two here, where they're the same spirit, where one calculates something that is, of course, measured experimentally as well, and then matches and then describes it in continuum perturbation, uh, continuum perturbative QCD, um, and uh, uses the lattice calculation in the continuum limit with continuum perturbative QCD to extract the quantities of interest. And um, that's the method that I'll be describing here. So this starts with a discussion of the dependence of the meson mass on the quark mass. And this is the standard HQET formula. MH here is the heavy quark mass. Uh, lambda bar can be thought of as the energy of the light degrees of freedoms, the gluons and the light quarks. And then uh, this is the kinetic energy, and this is the hyperfine energy, so it's the, from the spin of the, of the quark. And uh, these, these things don't really get meaning until we, um, we specify a scheme. So a natural choice would be using the pole mass but we have the renormalin ambiguity here. Needless to say, the physical quantity, the meson mass, is unambiguous. So if you have a renormalin ambiguity in the pole mass, then that, of course, is compensated by the other terms here. And there's a whole bunch of uh, ambiguities at higher and higher orders in principle. OK. So um, one can then choose not the pole mass, but a different mass. Um, MS bar is not so good, but, and then people uh, started thinking about threshold masses that are listed here. The problem with these is that they often introduce a new factorization scale. So, uh, and that can be problematic. In fact, Javad was playing around with um, some of those masses, and, um, and that was then the, uh, uh, then the motivation to think about uh, going beyond that. And that's precisely what, uh, what we did with something that is called the minimum, the minimal renormalon subtracted mass, or MRS. I'm going to say MRS from now on because I'm stumbling over those words. So that's another short distance mass that removes only the leading renormalon ambiguity from, from the pole mass. And of course, that means that changes the, that influences, that defines lambda bar, MRS, et cetera. And this, uh, this scheme is, not, is gauge and scale independent, so it's a, another threshold mass, so it doesn't introduce an additional factorization scale that one has to worry about and that one has to show that things are independent of. Okay, so uh, let me uh, give you a brief discussion of the uh, MRS mass, uh, where it came from. And... Um, so all of these equations are taken from, uh, from this paper that was written by Javad together with uh, Nora, Andreas, and Antonio. And um, uh, so the, the outline, more details beyond this outline are in this paper. So let's start with the usual relationship between the pole mass and the MS bar mass. And uh, as written here, and then of course it's well known that the coefficients grow factorially. And uh, then the observation, which is not a new observation, that the leading renormalon is actually independent of the mass. And that's um, what was also used, uh, you know, that's part of the reason why this, um, uh, why the residual mass makes sense in, in HQET as well. So, uh, then there's this, there's this paper by Javad that I advertised previously, which uh, looked at the large end behavior in a little bit more detail. Uh, so he used the geometric scheme for the coupling where, where things are rather simple. And uh, he found this recursion relation, which he solved. 
and uh, he found the basically the Renormalon normalization uh, in this way. So, um, so that's the starting point for the MRS mass. Uh, so now the, the pole masses is just a rearrangement. I subtract something here, and, and this term here is put into here. After Borel summation, I can then write this um, as a term that is, uh, that is uh, always finite. These coefficients are always small. And this is a very well-behaved series. And then the renormalon is basically living here at leading order, where the ambiguous term is put into delta m. That's like a, that's our residual mass here. But there is still an unambiguous term that can be evaluated. So instead of subtracting the entire thing, only subtracting uh, the ambiguous term, and that's what is meant by the minimal renormalon subtracted mass. Only delta m is subtracted, and this is kept. Okay, so, and it can be shown that the, that the ambiguity is precisely proportional to lambda ms bar. Thank you. Okay, so here's more, here's more um, equations just to show you that this can be evaluated, has been evaluated. Uh, so to summarize, what we'll be using is uh, as, our, as our ansatz for describing the heavy meson masses is this expression where the um, MRS mass is basically the same as the pole mass with the uh, leading ambiguity subtracted, so minus delta M. And, of course, there's still subleading renormalon terms in there. So here's the MRS mass definition in all of its glory. Um, the a big point here is that I should emphasize is that now the coefficients are all small. There is no growing. They are all small. And so this, this smallness, these small coefficients in this series means that perturbative truncation effects are basically small. This, is a, this, this a series is known to four orders. So that's one of the main points. Okay, now in my last however many minutes I have. Let me talk about the lattice setup. I've already uh, showed this before. Um, so this is the a, a picture of the ensembles, two parameters, two relevant parameters in these ensembles, the lattice spacing and the C-pion masses. And we cover a large range of lattice spacings. And um, pushing to these really small lattice spacings, in particular 0.03 Fermi, is of course, motivated not by, um, not by light quark physics, but by studying B quark physics. So here are more details listed here about these ensembles, and here are more details that you can peruse at your leisure. And these are only the ensembles that have physical C strange quarks. We also include ensembles with unphysical C strange quarks so that we can actually study the strange quark mass dependence in excruciating detail. Um, in, in, in addition, then, on each of these ensembles, we, uh, we uh, use a range of light valence masses. So we generate a range of light valence mass propagators, as well as a range of heavy uh, valence mass propagators. Uh, so if you add all of these together as data points on which we're calculating the, the um, meson masses, we have 384 data points, each of which, of course, is a distribution, is coming from the ensemble. So this simulation basically covers a rather big region of this parameter space. Um, and what we ended up doing is we omitted, we ended up omitting from the base fit, from our preferred fit, the 0.15 Fermi data over here. Um, and you can see later on that they, they don't have a big effect um, when we put them back in. Okay, so with so many data points, we do need a fit function that, um, uh, that is uh, complicated enough. Uh, this is just a quick slide to, to, to talk about the scale setting. I'm going to skip it here. Um, this is just to, to discuss how we set the physical scale and the relative scale in this calculation. It's not, it's not um, 
I mean, it's just a technical point. Okay, so we need to, um, we need to uh, augment this, this formula to include lattice spacing dependence, to include light quark mass dependence, to include discretization from the heavy quarks, uh, to include higher order terms from the HQT expansion, et cetera. So uh, we start out with something that's um, a huge mouthful, heavy meson rooted because um, the C quarks, the determinant is, is rooted in order to get two plus one plus one, Partially quenched, partially quenched refers to the fact that we have um, different valence quark masses um, as well as the same valence quark masses as what, as what is in the C. So we, have, uh, we tune this parameter separately. AS is all staggered and then that's chi PT. So that's uh, written down at next to leading order and then we add next to next to leading and N cubed LO analytic terms we also add higher order terms in the HQT expansion. We add additional light quark discretization effects, additional heavy quark discretization effects. And throughout, we write the expansion in terms of natural expansion parameters with coefficients that should be of order one. There's no funny dimensional terms in there. All in all, we have 77 fit parameters, um, which we fit to these 384 data points. Yeah. Right, so in addition to the, the discretization effects that are from the taste okay, breaking so effects, break right, right, so these are the generic, generic terms. Okay. Okay, so um, I think I'm gonna skip this. This is another technical point and I'm running out of time. Um, that's just describing um, how, how, what is the fit parameter here? How we construct the fit parameter? Well, we're basically uh, using a lot of uh, tech here. We're using to fifth order the anomalous dimension. We're using the MRS M bar, um, MRS MS bar relationship that we know, and then there's the lattice inputs, and then this is our one fit parameter. Okay. So here are some. Uh, here is a plot of the data, a fraction of the data. So what is plotted here are meson masses only with a, with a strange light quark plotted uh, versus the MRS mass, heavy quark mass, for ensembles, uh, only for the ensembles where we have uh, physical C quarks. So the ensembles are only the physical C quarks, and since we cut out the 0.15 Fermi ensemble, there are only four ensembles in here. The continuum, which is this very faint um, turquoise line here, which you can't see, that's not a fit to only these data. That's the fit to the entire data set. And then there's other faint lines that describe the, the fit lines to the um, individual ensembles. The dashed vertical lines here are the lines um, where uh, at any given lattice spacing, A times the B quark mass would be large, A times the heavy quark mass would be larger than 0.9. So that's why we have these open symbols that are not part of, that are not included in the fit. Okay, so we can, uh, we can see that the relationship between the meson mass and the quark mass is mostly linear. To actually look at uh, the difference, we might plot the difference versus the uh, heavy quark mass. And here you can see the, a little bit more the lattice spacing dependence as well as the continuum fit and uh, plotting it versus one over the um, heavy quark mass shows you that the relationship is mostly um, in one over the heavy quark mass, mostly linear with a slight bit of curvature. So that's coming from the higher order terms that are included. And so here is again uh, focusing on only physical mass ensembles. And here is 
the data versus the same continuum extrapolation. This is the, the fit is not different. These are just different data that are plotted. The, the fit is one fit. That's the same fit. And these fit lines are just to the different, to different cross sections of the data. So here we're showing data with, um, where the light sea quarks are at point two of the strange mass. So which means that we can also show the data from the uh, finest ensemble, 0.03 Fermi, where um, all of the heavy quark masses are, uh, are below 0.9 in lattice units. Okay, so basically you see that the fit describes the data really well and that we get a continuum line, that we get a, uh, the de continuum dependence of the heavy meson mass on MHMRS uh, with very nice accuracy as is shown in this band here. And here's just a uh, little bit more that shows you the quality of the fit. Yes. Yes. Right. And that's and that's of course what these data points are. Okay. Right. Right. So. So. So here's the procedure. So there's a cru crucial step here. Okay, so what, uh, what I skipped when I talked about the scale setting is I skipped also that we're using, with a scale setting, we're also using a reference mass. So it's this P4S uh, scale, setting, scale setting scheme, and the reference mass is 0.4, is 0.4 MS. That's our reference mass. Okay, in, in units of the physical strange quark mass. So one input here is um, this relationship here. Okay, so this relationship here tells us that the ratio, the ratio of the MS bar masses to, is the same as the ratio of the bare masses up to discretization effects, which are already part of the calculation. Okay. So that's, uh, that's maybe the ingredient that, um, that you are missing here, okay? So, um, so, and then you just, so you use this, and then you insert basically, this is, uh, you use this to insert unity, and then you pull this apart. Now this is our fit parameter. This is the reference mass that is, that is the fit parameter that comes out of the fit. So, so you already, already know the MS bar mass for, for some Right. What we're fitting to is the MS bar mass because we're fitting to continuum perturbation theory. So what we're fitting to is the MS bar mass and through this trick here where you, you know, we, there's, a, there's this lattice input that's the ratio of the bare lattice masses that now doesn't depend on, you know, we don't care that that's bare versus. So the only perturbation theory involved is between the MS bar and the MR. That's right. That's right. And that's in this here. Okay, so that's the for loop perturbation theory. Uh, thank you for slowing me down. <laughs> that's the for loop uh, perturbation theory expression that's in here. This is the five loop anomalous dimension running. Okay, so yes, this is. So the only thing that is in here is continuum perturbation theory. Thank you. That's a very important point. And it's amazing that you just came from Japan and asked this important question. <laughs> Literally stepped off the plane. Okay. Thank you, Shoji. So let me, um, uh, let me continue now. Uh, what I want to show here is the stability of the fit. So, of course, we have our base fit, but we varied, uh, we varied the fit in many, 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 many different ways. I'm only showing a few variations here. So, the base fit, uh, as a reminder, includes all ensembles. 
uh, with lattice spacings of less than 0.15 Fermi. Um, and this is a, this just tells us the, the, the number of states that were included in the correlator fits. If we, uh, if we include the 0.15 Fermi ensembles, you see that except in a couple of cases, the difference in particular for the uh, physical parameters, um, the difference is very small. Uh, and that's, of course, here why we ended up excluding this. Uh, if we drop the 0.03 Fermi ensemble, then you can see the difference between the results with and without it, which tells you that the 0.03 Fermi ensemble has basically no pole on the data. So um, it is, of course, we like to have it in there because that's where the physical B quark mass is less than 0.9, but um, we already have enough information about the B quark mass, about the heavy quark masses, even without it. Okay, and here you, you see the poll. If we include fewer excited states and take the, this is all the ground state amplitudes, take the, do a fit with fewer excited states, then there are some cases where there's a slight poll, but, um, you know, with fewer excited states, the fit results themselves are more precise, so the errors are smaller, so we're using the result with the larger errors with more excited states. It's just to test that there are the excited state contaminations, if any, are small. Then another, uh, I think, important uh, variation is to look at the perturbative truncation effects. Um, so the, as a reminder, the base fit includes the four-loop relationship and the five-loop anomalous dimension and five-loop beta function. Um, and then the order alpha s, the, the fit results labeled as order alpha s cubed, only includes the three-loop relationship, et cetera, et cetera. So going down one order, one consistent order, uh, gives you these results. Going down another order gives you these results. And then only doing one loop matching gives you these results here. So the ratios don't really care at all, uh, not too surprising. And then the individual masses, you can see this really nice convergence. Of course, one loop is not enough, two loop is better. After three loop, there's basically no change. So this, uh, this lets us to uh, say that the truncation effects are uh, really small. Okay, and here's a, here's a um, summary of all the results. By the way, I took some of the results that I showed here from Javad's plenary talk at the Lattice Conference last year, where he uh, gave a review talk on quark masses. So I'm just basically advertising that here by, and it was also easier than typing this all up myself. And uh, then we also have results for the HQET parameters, and uh, we can use the, um, the previous mill calculation um, of these ratios to then also quote MS bar masses for the individual up, down, and average up, down mass. And here are comparisons between uh, everybody's results, which where I use the latest plots that are on the flag uh, uh, group's website over here. And um, here you see the comparison um, between lattice determinations of the average up and down quark and the average strange quark. You see where we're sitting with, these, with this big uh, slab of parameter space um, and, you know, these 384 points, etc. cetera, and uh, additional, actually, work that I didn't talk about, um, understanding electromagnetic effects. Uh, you can see that the errors here are rather small. Um, but the results are completely consistent with other high-precision determinations. And in particular, I also wanted to point out to you the difference between these averages and PDG. The PDG error is much larger over here as well uh, than the averages that are coming from a very serious uh, review and a consideration of all of the lattice results that is performed by the flag collaboration. And then here are similar comparisons plots for the uh, charm quark and for the B quark. Uh, 
because this talk was written just in time, I didn't have time to, to put these results that Peter discussed earlier uh, onto these plots. These didn't make it into the flag averages because the paper didn't come out till, till January and flag has deadlines, so it will certainly be in the next iteration, and I don't know if they're working on a web update to include the results from, from this group as well. But if you were to plot them, which if I have time, I might update the slide and put them in by hand, you would see that they're completely consistent with other high precision results. So there's not, um, they add to that, but uh, there's not any, any problems with, with those. Okay, and here's a one comparison plot for the ratio. I don't know why there aren't more ratios in the, in flag, in the flag review. So let me conclude. Um, I've shown you our calculation of, uh, uh, our lattice QCD calculation that leads to precise quark mass determinations for all five quarks. So the only, the only one that we don't own is the top quark. Um, I've also shown you comparison plots where we see that results that use completely different methods have different systematics, are completely statistically independent, and we get really good consistency between, uh, between these results, between these lattice results. And these are, you know, roughly the uncertainties with which you know the B quark mass and the charm quark mass. Now, if you take these, um, if you take these uh, flag averages uh, seriously, these are much larger than the uncertainties quoted by the particle data group, and they should simply adopt the flag averages there's no reason for them to, to continue sleeping on this. So that's my little soapbox here. Um, and then just a point, another point I wanted to make is that the MRS scheme, as, as it is worked out at the moment, is only removing the um, leading renormalon ambiguity. But you can work harder and go and uh, extend this formalism to include the subleading renormalons. Nobody has done that yet. It needs somebody with um, the kind of calculational muscle that Javad has. Alas, he's in Iran right now. Maybe he's working on that. <laughs> that would be nice. Okay, that's it. Questions? Uh, well, I have two comments and then a question. I mean, the comments is that when you write the sum rule for the determination of the normalization of the renormalon by Javad, I'm empathetic to his work, but sum rules existed before. Uh, this I wanted to point it out. More than, more than one that they have the same asymptotic behaviors or determinations using sum rules. An analogous formulas exist. Yeah. And about the definition of this MRS, what, just to put also in context, this MRS is also the principal, what some people will call it, the principal value mass up to a constant which is of order lambda QCD. So this... Uh, yeah, it's also related to the, just the renormal on subtracted mass. Yeah, but so the part, they are, there's... Right. But the pr principal value or some mathematicians, they will call it the medium resumation. And then the question, because the error is very small, I mean, from the theory side. I mean, that you put one MEV as a systematic error for the bottom mass. Uh, yes. So. You mean here? Yeah, I mean this, yeah. So basically, you are saying that with what we know already about perturbation theory, is enough because I understand that the statistical error is from lattice. Uh, so, well, the statistics is the statistical fit error. Yeah. So. And uh, this is part of the, um, this is part of the systematic error. And then here, this larger error is the uncertainty in the coupling. Yes. So that. No, my point is that, really, the error, the claim error, from theory is basically zero <laughs> compared with the others. 
I mean, because this uh, from this the this is this is uh, not not a um, uh, this is not really a a uh, theory error. This is lattice systematics, finite volume, right. etc. So, yes. So the statement is that uh, that truncation effect. I mean, the truncation of perturbation theory, what is the error associated to this? Uh, so it's smaller. Is it smaller than? than not smaller than, than the sum of this, but much smaller than this. Um, let me, or uh, when, you, when you have done this error estimate, you only consider dif the difference between the alpha cube and the alpha to the four as a at a fixed scale, at the scale of the mass, or you have also tried to see what happens if you do a variation of the mu dependence of the result? So the only mu dependence uh, that comes in is coming from the coupling, right? The mass is, uh, there's no scale with the, with the MRS mass. In the, in the, you know, the only mu dependence comes in from, uh, you know, the scale at which you evaluate the well, you have a mu the, dependence when you when you come the, the, the MS bar the, mass, the MRS mass in terms of the MS bar right. mass. Right, right. So obviously, you could do the expansion with alpha evaluated at the mass. Yes. Or you could put alpha evaluated at mu, and see what is the difference. Yes. So uh, we've uh, played around with the scale dependence, and with you know with varying those uh, varying the scale um, a little bit. I don't remember the details of that, uh, but the conclusion was that it wasn't giving us um, signif any significant differences. So the differences were similar to what we were seeing with truncation effects. But I have to, but I have to, um, okay, this, uh, yeah. 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 yeah, but sometimes in one case, typically, or at least what I do is that I try both things and I take the error of the bigger error of the two options because at some specific scale maybe you get something which is very tiny as is an artifact of the specific scale you have taken. So this should be investigated. I, I, I believe this has been looked okay. at, but I, I'd have to check. So um, again, uh, um, following what Antonio said, I mean this, if I understood correctly, this MRS mass it is Antonio's mass with some with a sum rule result for the normalization. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So this, this sum rule was was figured out in a paper in 2008, and then your colleague just rediscovered it uh, many years later. And a few uh, a few months later, we also showed that that our sum rule was essentially the same as what you used uh, taking the ratio of the um, the actual coefficient with respect to the asymptotic coefficient. And when you say that it doesn't depend on a scale, uh, it I, don't, I don't think that is right. There's I mean, not, there's not. Um, you, I think you pick one scale, but it has to depend on a scale. Otherwise, it's a mass. It's a dimensional for quantity, and it does depend. Well, on like a scale the and, like and, the pole mass, it's a threshold mass. So there isn't, you know, there's no. We, we're not introducing an additional factorization scale. My impression is that you just pick one, right? And then you say it doesn't depend anymore. It's like you say the MS bar mass. Does it depend on mu because I take m at m, right? That it's not really. It's my, my impression is that you you really have some dependence. You just pick one, but actually having a dependence is not is nothing bad because now you are going to match your MRS mass to the MS bar mass, and you want to do this matching in a way in which you don't have large logs, and then knowing the, the the dependence on this of this mass on on the scale will help you not having these large logs. Uh, so the. Um the MS bar mass, the scale dependence of the MS bar mass is, of course, built in to the formula yeah. that I showed. Um, I'm talking about other dependence. I, I know. Uh, no, it's, uh, I mean, the MRS mass is basically the pole mass with the Renormalon ambiguity subtracted, only the Renormalon ambiguity. So like the pole mass, there is, you know, the pole mass too, you don't talk about varying its scale not it's the a, pole mass, of course not. But. So, so it's basically the pole mass. No, but what you did, you show that the ambiguity doesn't depend on M. So you can subtract it, sub, uh, replacing M by something else. And this something else is the scale upon which your mass depends. 
right? Do I understand this correctly? I'm not sure I understand your comment, Maybe but. Should, uh, yeah. Yeah, so I was just wondering how uh, the absolute uh, lattice spacing uh, error enters. So when you say F pi, of course, you know it from PDG mm -hmm. uh, with very high accuracy. But if, when you relate to F pi calculated in the lattice, of course, that has its own statistical error, possible systematic errors uh, of whatever sort, electromagnetic yes. effect, isospin breaking. Yes. So where yes. does it enter? Uh, so, because all this absolute masses should. Right. So, so are you claiming that you could uh, determine the lattice spacing to 0.1% accuracy? Uh, well, it's uh, it's about 0.2%. Impressive. Yeah. 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 So yes, all of these things are included. So there's a separate, you know, just light, um, light, light calculation. I mean, it's also part of this calculation. You do an analysis, uh, and you get a pi. And yes, you have to include electromagnetic corrections. Yeah, you have to the number is, you say, one, one MeV uh, systematic. So that should include basically everything, including the scale uncertainty. Uh, no, the F pi is. Well, the F pi is PGG, so that, that right. I'm not worried about that one. But the other, so what is this one MeV systematic? Uh, so I think that the rest of the. Um, uh, the rest of the scale uncertainty is folded in okay. to there because, you know, it it's part of the fit. You know, you have the you have both the relative scale and you have the absolute scale, mm -hmm. so it's already in there. So it's not just the statistical error of our F pi determination that goes in there, but it's also all of the systematics mm -hmm. that are part of it. So I I I think that. Um, I believe that it's in there. I can check, but I would be surprised if it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Okay, any more questions? I think we should move on because it was a good series of questions. So let's thank Aida again.